Hi everyone, it's Judy. Welcome back to Rose Lane. Today is Sit a Spell Sunday, and I just wanted to take the uh, just a couple of minutes before we get started to say thank you uh, to everybody who has been uh, commenting um, and resonating with these past couple of uh, videos that we've done. Um, again, this is more about just talking um, about what you talk about with friends and just working on whatever it, uh, project it is I'm working on. Not so much to show you, you know, how to do or what to do or what I'm doing or whatever, but it's more about the conversation. And I've been getting wonderful, wonderful responses from people who are just... Um, clicking in with a lot of what I'm saying. Uh, it's bringing up memories for them and, um, you know, and they're willing to share their stories with me. And I've been very, very blessed by those stories. So I just want to say thank you. I just want to say keep it coming. I love hearing your stories, uh, apparently as much as you like hearing mine. <laughs> so um, I just wanted to, uh, to say thank you to everybody for that. And I hope this can continue for a very long time. So I have my quote for today. And my quote today is very short and simple. It's by somebody named Robert Brault, who I have no idea who he is. And... Um, Somebody may. He may be famous, but I'm not good with famous. So, uh, but this says, enjoy the little things for one day you may look back and realize they were the big things. So that being said, simple, simple things um, in life uh, that we can consider and think about, um, wish, you know, sometimes you don't know how much, um, you miss things until you don't have them. And I, I say things, I should be saying like people, um, because it's really, it's the people that make the situations in our lives, isn't it? And um, I think about how much I am away from my family um, doing what it is I do I've been away from them quite a bit. And uh, I get to visit from time to time, but I don't really get to be with them very often. Um, so I think, you know, I remember a while back reading a uh, an article. It was probably like in the Woman's Day magazine or something that shows you <laughs> we're stretching. We're going back here. Um, but it was about stress. It was an article about stress and it was a woman who wrote the article and nobody famous as far as I know. Again, I, I don't do famous. I don't really know too much about famous. Um, but she had said there are some stresses that are good in her life. You know, you, um, I, I'm paraphrasing. I, I mean, I really can't say that I remember specifically um, the exact topics that she mentioned. But, you know, she said something to the effect about, you know, you know, stressing over bills and that there's always bills in the mail and, you know, that kind of stuff. And she says she's grateful that, you know, she's able to pay the bills, you know, kind of a thing. Um, uh, stressing about your job or your boss. And then, you know, she says, but, you know, I'm grateful that I have a job. Some people don't have a job, uh, you know, and just things like that. And I thought, you know, there are certain stresses in our lives that are good. Uh, nothing's ever going to be carefree. Um, so it's just sort of, something we just kind of have to accept, but we really like having um, no stress in our lives, but we will um, almost strive for that, but that we're never going to achieve it. We're never going to achieve not having stress. Um, so it's a matter of how we look at things again, 
How do we look at things? What do we think? So it brings me to a couple of people that I would probably want to talk about a little bit more. I've talked a lot, a uh, bit about my mother, and I'm sure she'll creep in um, to my conversations again because she left a huge impact, a good, very good, huge impact on my life. And um, so the two people I'm going to talk about, one I know, both related to me, one I know and one I never knew. And the one I know is my sister and the one I never knew is my great grandmother, one of my great grandmothers. This isn't gonna be easy. <laughs> It just wants to twist. Um, so first, I guess I'll talk about my great-grandmother. Um, she was born in 1862. Her name was Mary Jane Crandall. And everybody called her Jenny. And um, my mother had two grandmothers. My mother's mother's mother, okay, was not a very happy, very loving kind of person. I'm not saying that she didn't love, but uh, she also, I really did not know her either, though she was alive until I was about six, I think. Um, so she would have died in like 1966, I believe. And she was in her 90s, in her early 90s. She was born, she had been born in 1872, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, 1874 or something like that and um so she was not quite as sweet as jenny was apparently and um so jenny was really my mother's favorite grandmother not necessarily by choice and it's not to say that my mother didn't care for or love her other grandmother she just didn't make it happen <laughs> Um, her paternal grandmother, her mother's, or her maternal grandmother, rather, um, from her mother's side. Um, her paternal grandmother, however, Jenny, was apparently just one of the sweetest people that ever lived. And I loved hearing stories about her. And um, my mother lived in New Jersey, and my great-grandmother, Jenny, I'll just call her Jenny, uh, from here on in, lived in Pittsfield, Massachusetts, which is where my mother was born. And um, every now and then my mother would take the train up when she was in her 20s, 20s or so, she would take the train up to see uh, her grandmother in Pittsfield. And um, where she lived was a three-story house and she lived she was like almost 80 or in her 80s or whatever it was and she lived on the third story bless her sweetheart and um there was a back porch there and my mother would get be up there and my grandmother would have been uh jenny would have been fussing um the entire time uh that she was she was there or before she would actually get up there even, and she'd be cooking and, you know, getting everything ready. And she was this tiny little, you know, kind of Irish lady, English-Irish lady. And um, I'm wondering if I should go ahead and do that again back here. Um, and uh, so she would fuss a lot. And so my mother would get up there and she'd say, Grandma, you, you know, you've got to stop fussing. You've got to stop doing all of this and, um, you know, just take it easy. You're doing too much. Just please, please take it easy. And she'd say, OK, Dolores, I'll my mother's name was Dolores. OK, Dolores, I'll go in and, you know, and I'll take a nap and, you know, I'll relax for a little while. And she's like, thank you. So my mother would sit out on the porch, which was right outside her bedroom window, my grandmother's bedroom window. And. Uh, She'd read. She'd read the newspaper. She'd read the magazines or something like that while my grandmother was supposedly sleeping. The tiny little thing that she was, yeah, I think I like that better. Tiny little thing that she was, my grandmother would 
very quietly get up, sneak out of her room, and she would make my mother, every time, every time, she would make my mother a huckleberry pie. That was my mother's favorite. Now, when I heard, heard the story, when my mother would tell me the story when I was younger, when I got a little bit older, I started looking to see if I could find huckleberries. You know, I couldn't find a huckleberry for her hiding her hair anywhere. I couldn't find seeds, I couldn't find plants, I couldn't find fruit, I couldn't, <laughs> couldn't find one anywhere. So I was a little upset by that because I wanted to make my mother a huckleberry pie because she loved them so much. And uh, so, so anyway, my grandmother would get up and she'd sneak out of the bedroom real quiet and she'd make my mother a huckleberry pie. And my mother wouldn't know it until she started to smell it. And then she, she would smell it. She'd go into the house and she'd peek in on my grandmother. Of course it was in the oven, but she'd peek in on my grandmother and she'd be sleeping. She would be laying on her bed sleeping, pretending apparently to be snoring. And, uh, it was just, you know, it was just hysterical. I thought it was just so cute. She was this little, <clears throat> excuse me, allergies again. She was this little five foot nothing, you know, hundred pound cutie. And uh, I could just imagine, you know, just imagine what that must have been like, you know, to be going up and having that happen. And she'd pull it every time, apparently. Um, became their routine, I suppose. So, but that was a story I remember my mother telling me about my grandmother. Another story that my mother had told me was when my second oldest uncle, my uncle John, had a birthday. He had, I guess, made mention that he had wanted a specific kind of cake, and I can't really remember the details of what that was, but a specific kind of cake um, for his birthday. Now, I guess they didn't do a whole lot of birthday cakes, uh, having so many of them in the house. Um, so when my grandmother heard that my uncle wanted this birthday cake, this shows you how much times have changed too. She made the cake and she mailed it. She put it in the mail I don't know how you do that. I don't know how you can send a cake through the mail, but she did. And it got to, because she was in Massachusetts and they lived in Northern New Jersey. They lived in Bayonne. And um, yeah, she mailed the cake down to my uncle because he wanted one and probably was not going to get one. So, uh, which was just, it just shows you the adorableness of this woman. I think I'm just going to move this down. And um, so these were memories of my mother's, you know, her own memories, um, or my uncle. It was his memory. It was his cake that came through the mail. And, uh, but the stories were told to me and they became part of me. Um, it allowed me to know someone. She passed away, Jenny. In 1950, as a matter of fact, she passed away on what would become my brother with the bird, my brother Jeff's birthday, November 8th in 1950. And, um, <clears throat> excuse me. So I never, I was, I wasn't born until 1959. So I never got to know her, but I got to know her just the same through my family who did know her, who paid attention to the little things and passed them on to me and to others in our family. So, um, so that was one of the, the neat stories. And one of the neat things about that, um, I think I'm going to try cause I can't stop being symmetrical. I'm trying to be shabby guys. It doesn't work. Um, one of the, um, I don't think I can do it there though. I think I'll go ahead and fake it someplace else. One of the, um, 
neat things about the story is after I had grown up and traveled for what it is worth, haven't done a lot of traveling, but my work has taken me to um, different places. I've lived in different places. So I've ended up traveling on a lot of different roads. And the funny, funny thing is, size of my family, everywhere I have been, with maybe possibly the exception of Kentucky, I'm not sure about Kentucky, um, but everywhere I have been, I have had ancestors, which is amazing. Um, I have lived in Springfield, Massachusetts. My mother, of course, born in Pittsfield, not that far away, just about an hour. But I also had ancestors from before that time, back in the 1700s. There were some who lived in Springfield. I lived in Springfield. Uh, when I was in Bridgeport, I had people, uh, Bridgeport, Connecticut, I lived in Milford. I had relatives, ancient, you know, long, long ago, uh, relatives who lived in Milford, um, uh, Connecticut. Uh, it's, it's just been amazing. I lived in and around the Albany area, uh, small towns just outside of Albany, and right across the river, um, right across the river is where Jenny was born. And uh, a lot of my family settled there. There's still family there um, that were related to them, distant cousins. Uh, I cannot untwist this. Um, that still live there. Uh, the family name is Crandall. And I still have Crandalls who live in a small town called Hoosick Falls in upstate New York, just off the Hudson River. Um, everywhere I go, uh, it seems I've had family for the most part. I don't know about here in Johnstown yet, but <laughs> who knows? We seem to get all over the place. So it's been fun because I've been able to find out about them. I've been able to visit graves, um, which I love. And, and I'll probably get into that even in this conversation because to me, it's a little thing, um, but it's a big thing. It's just one of those little things that I don't want to take for granted. And I'll get into that in a minute, but um, nonetheless, I just find that fascinating. So when I would travel some of these roads, when I lived up in Springfield and I would go back and forth to the lower part of the tier of New York State, um, and travel those highways, I would see the train tracks along the side of the road. And, whoops, <laughs> I'm not sure, not sure where I put this one. Um, oh my, okay. Hmm, I think it might be, oh dear. <laughs> I don't know where this came from now, you know, I don't know. I don't know. I'm going to stick it in here. We'll see what happens. I'm not sure where I got it from. Um, but, um, yeah, I would, I would look at the train tracks along the side of the road as we would travel up the highway. And I would remember my mother's stories. And I would remember, uh, you know, I'd look at the, at the tracks as we we're driving by. And I would imagine the train going by, you know, alongside the road there while we were on it and I would look into a window and I would see my mother's face as a young woman, <clears throat> which always tickled me to, um, to think about that, to, you know, to imagine her being on the train like that. And, uh, yeah, so I always thought that was kind of nice. I'm just trying to decide where else I, I think I might want to put, um, another one of these ruffles. So I maybe, you know, I think I'm going to be smart here and not like totally dismember my book. <laughs> I'm going to put this to the side. Um, maybe I'll be able to recognize where I took it out of. So yeah, I would imagine my mom on those trains going by. And sometimes trains did go by, but they're, they don't look like they did back in the 1940s when my mom would travel. But I could, I have a very good imagination if I want to have one. And, uh, I could just see her, you know, looking back at me 
um, she was at that point when we lived in Bridgeport, she was, she was still with us. But by the time I had, she passed away, um, when I lived in Bridgeport and, or Milford, um, and, um, so when I would take those roads again, when we worked up in Springfield and lived in Springfield, Massachusetts, I would imagine her looking out at me from the train window. I got to trim. Well, I'm not going to bother with that. I think it'll be okay. It's so scrunchy. I don't think you'll be able to tell um, that I didn't cut it straight. <laughs> but um, so, yeah, so having her tell me just such a simple story. I mean, it's not a big deal, you know, and it's, and it's a little funny, but it's not, you know, knee slapping, um, you know, it's chuckle worthy, but you know, not a, not a big belly laugh kind of thing, but it was a, just a simple little story that shaped a lot of my life. Um, so I was just, you know, I just, I love hearing, love hearing the stories and uh, just takes me back and to places I've never been and helps me meet people I never knew. Um, oops, that one you'll see. So yeah, so I really enjoyed her telling me those stories and she would tell me more about Jenny um, in that Oh dear. I don't know. Why. You know what? Sooner or later, this is going to, I think it's supposed to be on the other side. <laughs> my, my, my. All right. Well, you know what? I think I'm just going to go ahead. I'm going to do this one. Just do this one. I think we'll do that. So, um, Jenny had a parrot and uh, it would talk, it would answer the door. Well, you know, somebody would knock or whatever, but the parrot would call and the, and whoever would be, you know, coming a neighbor or <clears throat> whatever, the parrot would ask all kinds of questions. What do you want? You know, that kind of stuff. Um, and it did say Polly wants a cracker. The parrot's name was Polly, but one of my, oh dear, you know what? Let me, let me take this. This is too short. I have another piece over here. Um, <clears throat> my grandmother loved, well, Jenny, let me say Jenny, uh, loved the Lone Ranger. And of course this was on radio and she would turn on the radio and nobody was allowed to talk. Okay. You had to be quiet. If you were there in the house with her, all activity stopped when the Lone Ranger came on the radio. Well, the parrot had to be a wise guy, apparently, and would decide to ask her questions and to talk to her. During, cause he knew the rules and she would yell at him and he would just keep it up or she, I'm not sure, the bird's name was Polly, but I, I don't know if it was a boy or a girl, you know. Um, and uh, so she turned on the Lone Ranger and the parrot would start, hello, hello, Polly want a cracker, hello, 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 and she'd shh, shh, shh. listen to Lone Ranger, Lone Ranger, Lone Ranger, Lone Ranger and Tonto, hi-ho silver, he'd go, and she'd be like, you be quiet, I'm trying to listen, hello, <laughs> just, I thought that was just hilarious, I'm like, oh my gosh. So, again, just some of these funny stories helping me to put a personality um, with the face that I see, that cute little tiny round old lady face that I see um, in, the, uh, in the few photos that I do have of Jenny, but I do have some. And when I lived in Springfield, um, I was fortunate my sister had come to visit at that time. She lived in Colorado. And um, I was fortunate when she came to visit, she and I took a trip out uh, to the town. And though, of course, we couldn't go into the house, we could see the house. And I don't know what a huckleberry pie smells like. I have no clue. 
but I could swear I smelled one bacon. I could swear. I could swear I hear a parrot through the window and the radio playing. <clears throat> Let me drop this in my little lace bag over there. So, I'm stuck. So, like I said, it's it's just those little things um, in life that we take for granted at the time. It's, you know, not that we don't think it or enjoy it or, you know, whatever, but um, we just don't seem to think of it. For those of you who remember the 70s, we don't think of it as a Kodak moment. Uh, necessarily. Um, I've done it again, haven't I? Well, maybe I haven't. Oh, no, that's right, because that's the front and the... Well, that's not right. Is that right? That is right. Okay. Gee. Um, but when I got married the first time, um, when my father wasn't with us, of course, and my brother, who lived in Col who still lives in Colorado, uh, the oldest brother, walked me down the aisle. And um, you know, you're supposed to have that dance with your dad, and you know that kind of stuff. The, the bride is supposed to have a dance with her dad, and uh, so I danced with my brother, who, like me, is not a dancer. Um, but slow dancing, you know, you can kind of hold each other up and sway, if you know what I mean. Um, it's kind of about what I do. And, uh, and I'm not any better now that I've gained weight and gotten a lot older. But um, so my song to dance with my brother was Paul Anka's uh, Times of Your Life. And... Um, for those of you who remember the song, I'm not going to get into all the lyrics. You might want to Google it if you're interested. And I'm taking a tissue because my allergies are just driving me crazy these last few days. So, last several days. Excuse me. So, that was our, that was my song that we danced to. And, um... That is truly, excuse me, what life ought to be like. Um, I guess that's kind of what I'm talking about. The way life ought to be. If anybody out there is from Maine, <laughs> you know your license plate says the way life should be. Or your welcome signs coming in um, from the highway, you know, Welcome to Maine, the way life should be. I think I need to pull this one back a little bit. Um, so, but that's how life should be. And I might have referenced, I think I have referenced um, once before. I'll tell you, working with Sorry Silk is like working with cobwebs. Oh my goodness, drives me nuts. Um, pretty, but drives me nuts. And this I dyed, because this was just like an off-white natural color and I dyed it to go with the book a little bit. Need a little bit more lace back here, I think, and one in here, and then I think we're good. All right, so we'll put some here. Um, what was I saying? Oh, uh, I think I was talking about uh, Mayberry and the Andy Griffith show and my one of my favorite episodes was called Man in a Hurry. I'm almost positive um, I've referenced it before. And uh, <clears throat> it's about this man who, he's a businessman and he's driving through or near uh, Mayberry, it's a Sunday and his car breaks down about two miles outside of town which for some of us, we know that there is no such thing anymore as two miles outside of town. You just go from one place into the next and there is no real in-between, as it were. 
But um, so he walks, it's summertime, I guess, and he's hot and he's a heavy set man. And he's very gruff and very grouchy and in a hurry. He's, you know, in a hurry. And they're trying to get him to just, not trying to even trying to get him to relax, but they can't understand why he won't relax, you know, why he just won't, uh-oh. <laughs> to make sure I'm putting these all back in right side up. Uh, ooh, okay, there's one out of place here. Um, so anyway, um, it may, may change where I'm putting things now. Um, so he's trying to get his car fixed and they're trying to tell him it's Sunday and nobody's going to be around to fix the car. And he's like, well, I've got to be, you know, whatever the town is that he's got to be in, you know, by tomorrow morning and I need this fixed and da, 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 da. And, you know, they, you know, everything's like a party line on the telephone and, um, you know, they have the switchboard, Sarah, the switchboard operator, and he you know, is trying to make a phone call and he can't get through because two old ladies are talking. They don't see each other that often. And on Sundays, they spend hours on the phone and it ties up the phone for, you know, the whole, the whole place whole town and uh okay what have i done all right i'm gonna go here i think let me just go here and um so and he, he just gets so frustrated but you know they're they have a home cooked meal they have their sunday dinner then they're gonna make ice cream and you know they're sitting on the porch of course andy's playing his guitar and they're singing a little old country hymn the little brown church in the dale i think it's called and apparently this man knows that song and it brings him back to his childhood and that's what the song is talking about about they remember the church of their childhood the little brown church in the dale and he starts to sing it with them and for a minute he's calm until something happens and he gets all wound up again and he's running back and forth and he's talking real fast and all this kind of stuff so the car gets fixed they do him the favor, you know, and they get stuff done and um, he's going to get on his way. And Opie says something to him and he says, gee, I wish you would stay. You know, I would have gotten to sleep on the ironing board. And he's like, that sounds very uncomfortable. You know, the, the man in a hurry says, and Opie's like, no, that's adventure sleeping to sleep, get, get an opportunity to sleep on the ironing board. And of course, Aunt B makes him some sandwiches and, you know, fusses over him and all this kind of stuff. And as he's getting into the car, you know, and all this is happening, it suddenly occurs to him, you know, I like this. You know, you can see it. You can see it in his face. And, and he's, you know, he likes this. He, this is what he wants. This is, you know, where he wants to be. And uh, so he makes up a story about, you know, the car not sounding right or whatever. And uh, says that he'll spend the night if, if they'll allow him. And uh, Opie gets all excited because he's like, yay, I get to sleep on the ironing board. And, you know, he grabs him by the hand and, you know, he's like, let's go. You know, his Andy says, go show him where he's going to stay because he's going to stay in Opie's room. And, you know, it's just all of those simple, simple, simple things. Um, you just we have a tendency to just toss them aside. So I started talking about that. Now that isn't really, that wasn't immediately on my agenda. I was supposed to talk about my, um, my great grandmother, which I did. And I told you a couple stories there. And, um, then I was going to talk to you about my sister. Now my sister, she is about six and a half years older than me. And when I was born, she, I think, truly believed that I was her baby, you know, and she was like a mother to me, still is, okay? We're in our 60s, and she's still like a mother to me. And um, we were talking not too long ago on the phone, because we FaceTime once in a while, and um, we uh, talk on the phone a lot. And um, this is why I'm getting new ink, guys, because I'm getting these little brown things all over everything. Um, and she said, you know, 
I don't think we've ever fought, ever, that we've ever had a fight in our entire lives. And I was like, no, I don't think so. She goes, I don't think we've ever been mad at each other, that either one of us was ever mad at the other. And I was like, I don't think so. And I know that that is not always the situation for everybody. And I don't know how I got so blessed. I do have tea. See, I do have tea. I'm going to have a sip. Because I forgot I had it. Because <laughs> I keep it over there so I can't hurt myself or hurt anything else. Um, so I have just been so blessed with having, um, having the family that I have. Um, and I, I guess, and I said, you know, we talked about it and I said, you know, even growing up and even now we, we, my sister and I can often make the assumption that isn't, isn't everybody like this? Doesn't everybody, I mean, this is your sister. This is your family. It's like, how can you not love them? How can you not get along with them? How can you not, you know, how can that be? <laughs> I have been very, very, very blessed. And to the point where I almost feel guilty about it, to tell you the truth, um, that I have truly been that blessed with my family. So I think I might have mentioned, whoa, I'm a little too high up there. Hang on, guys. Um, I think I might have mentioned how when my sister and I get together, we are hopeless. As a matter of fact, my son and my niece, my sister's daughter, um, when we get together, they wait because there's at least one moment. They watch, they wait. I should have done this on this side first because I'm not paying attention. Um, for something funny to happen, that will just get my sister and I started. And and then that's it. It's, you know, all bets are off after that. And we just get the giggles. Now here we are, two, like I said, I think I might've mentioned this before, two supposedly mature grown up women. And we're like a couple of little girls. Somebody says something funny, and it might not even be that funny, but it just strikes a chord, you know? And, um, <laughs> And, and we're off and running, you know, with some ridiculous, uh, qu you know, little quip, something that we just came up with. And uh, I remember, and I'm going to tell you one, and, and I have to say this one word. It's not really a swear word, but I have to say this one word because it's, it's pertinent to the story. We had gone down, my husband, my son, and I had gone down to visit this was a few years ago. It was before COVID. And um, we had gone down to visit. And my sister and brother-in-law had taken... My niece was working at, at that time of day. That, you know, when we had gone out for, for that venture, she was not, unable to be with us. So we went to a local, beautiful local park. And we had stopped by this fountain. And we were sitting and we were talking. And my husband, who was a Marine... And I'm not sure how it came up, but he they started talking about Camp Lejeune or something, and that's where he had been. And uh, he said, well, maybe we can stop there on our way home. And he's talking about all of this stuff, and he's telling stories. And I'm like, well, you know, you know, kind of like talking. As he's talking, I'm talking kind of thing. And, um, you know, I said, well, you know, it's, you know, kind of out of the way. It's not exactly on the way home. And you know, that would take extra time and, and he's not talking and he says something and I'm kind of giving these answers. And uh, then he says, um, he says, you, you know, you wouldn't believe what it's like to be a Marine and, you know, all this kind of stuff. And I said, well, you know, I probably wouldn't, but you know, that's not the kind of life for me. I was never meant to be a soldier or whatever. And I'm rambling on just kind of like trying to not because I, I don't want to do this, obviously. And um, so he goes, yeah, you probably, um, you know, you probably wouldn't have liked it or whatever. He said, if you know, if you ever saw what had gone on or, you know, if we stopped there and you, and you saw some of the stuff that, you know, happens with how they train soldiers or something, 
you know, you'd probably, it would probably scare, uh, you, you would probably, and excuse me, you would probably crap your pants, he said. And I said, well, you know, I'm trying to give that up. And because I'm trying to make excuses not to go. I shouldn't have closed that. I didn't put it on the thing yet. And uh, my sister just got hysterical. She got so funny. My, my, uh, I mean, she laughed so hard. My son broke out his camera, you know, his uh, phone, and he started videotaping it mostly because Chelsea wasn't there. My niece wasn't there. And, um, I just put that on upside down, didn't I? Well, you can go like that. That'll work. Um, so she starts laughing to the point where she's crying. She's laughing so hard. And I said to her, like, what did I say? Because I couldn't remember what I said. I was just, you know, sort of rambling about um, why I didn't want to go. <laughs> and she couldn't speak. And she's trying to tell me. She's trying, and you know, through her laughter, she's trying to tell me what it was that I said. I don't know how I did this. How do I always manage to do things backwards, guys? I always do it. I always do it. Um... So she's trying to tell me through her tears, literally through her tears, um, what I had said. And uh, she's just hysterical laughing. And so I'm getting a word here and there, you know. And finally, I realized what she was saying. Now, when she laughs like that, I start laughing. I can't not laugh because it's just so contagious. And our two husbands are just standing there shaking their heads. My son is just shaking his head and rolling his eyes. Because, you know, they think this is just ridiculous that we, we get like this. But this is what we do every time. This is what we do, I, I, no matter what I do here. It's like putting an ornament on a Christmas tree. I always get it backwards, no matter how many times I try. And um, so finally she got it out. And when she told me what I had said, now she was... Like I said, she finally got it out. She was starting to gain some composure and, um, you know, from her laughing fit, she's finally starting to gain some composure that to the point where she was able to, you know, mostly tell me what I had said and I could make out what she's telling me that I had said. Well, now I start laughing because it was funny and I started laughing, which of course started her all over again so we just uh, it must have gone on for about 15 minutes that we were just laughing uncontrollably over a silly thing like that you know and uh but those are some of my greatest treasures in my life and guess what I had taken a test <laughs> and uh I was the test was about getting to know yourself better. <clears throat> and <clears throat> one of the things that you had to do in the test was um, list all the people in your life that were the most important to you. And then write, if they could give you a gift, okay, and it didn't have to be a thing, we're mostly talking more about, you know, a situation or a circumstance or something like that. But if they could give you a gift, what gift, knowing who they are, what gift would they give you? Okay. What would be the gift um, that you would have gotten from them? When I got to my sister, I said laughter because that's what she gives me the most of. She makes me laugh. And that takes away all my worries and concerns and my problems. And for a little while, you know, well, for a lot of the while, but for a little while, especially when we get those giggles, um, I get to forget for a minute that I'm a grown up, that I have bills to pay and things I have to do. And it's like being a little girl again. I just get to giggle for a little while. And I like it. <laughs> I have to say, I like it. So I would suggest then to you guys, um, 
most especially, that you don't forget to laugh. Um, that you hang on to those special things, those little things um, in your life. And uh, take them to heart. They, they truly mean something um, to be able to find joy in the simplest things, to remember to laugh, to remember to be thankful, um, to remember, I'll tell you something I remember, and this is my son, and, and I always have a lot of stories about my son, bless his heart. Um, I can remember when my son was born, um, we lived in a one bedroom apartment and, uh, the light, there was a night light alongside the nightstand on my bed and my son's crib was on the other side of the room and he was a very regular sleeper and I for in the beginning would seem to me that I would wake up about five minutes before he would when he was ready uh, for feeding. And um, so I would walk over to the crib and he'd just be starting to, to fuss. And um, I could see my shadow on the wall because the nightlight was behind me and I would pick him up for his feeding and I would see my shadow holding him. I could still see it like it was yesterday. He's going to be 34 years old. And um, this was upside down. And <laughs> I can still see it. And I remember picking him up and holding him and I would rub at the base of his neck where his, you know, where his hairline was. And I can remember the feel of it. Um, it was, uh, that's good. It was um, so soft, like a newborn kitten. When kittens are newly born and, oh, geez, this doesn't want to come out. Uh, there we go. Um, and you and you rub their little bellies. And that's, that's what the back of my son's neck with that fine baby fine hair felt like to me. It felt like a newborn kitten's belly. It was so soft. It was like, it almost was like it wasn't there. And um, I remembered it and I purposely, purposely, purposely would hold on to that memory. I would stand and I'd look at my shadow and his shadow on the wall. I'd remember how it felt to touch his hair and, um, you know, yeah, that's good. Um, that memory is still burned into my mind and I'll never forget that because I made a conscious decision that I did not want to forget these things. I wanted to remember them because I knew how fast children grow and I wanted to hold that in my heart um, for my lifetime, for his lifetime. Um, and I remember it like it was yesterday. And I'm so grateful for that. So if, if nothing more comes to you, I mean, I told you some stories and stuff, which are cute and it's fun to hear people's stories. Remember those things. That's what journals are for, right? Write things down so you don't forget where you've been, who you've been with, what are those special things um, in your life, and who are those special people in your life. And um, the special times, the simple times, are the most important of all. And we should not let them go. We shouldn't just pass over them uh, while they're happening. Um, I'm trying to remember. It was on Facebook, and I didn't write it down, and I should have. But I did put it on my personal page, which I don't usually say a lot. I repost things from other people. And um, it said something to the effect of, 
uh, she didn't know how busy she was until she stopped. She didn't know that she wasn't enjoying her life until she stopped being so busy to enjoy her life or something like that. Try to, uh, to find the, the quote and I'll put it in the description box here. Um, in case you're interested, don't let the busyness of life and I'm just as guilty, please, I am. Uh, but don't let the busyness of life stop you from living your life. Take the time. Stop and smell the roses, as they say. Take the time to pay attention. Um, when you're sitting in the car and it's quiet, you're stopped at a traffic light, perhaps, and it's quiet and the radio's not on, which is normal for me, um, if you listen carefully, you'll hear the birds. Even through the closed window, you'll hear the birds. Pay attention to those things, um, to their singing. They're out there, but we we bustle through our lives and and we pass by so much that we shouldn't. Those are the important things. Those are the big things in life. Um, don't take them for granted. Don't pass them by but grasp onto them with both hands and hold them close to your heart. You'll be a better person for it, I will guarantee. So I don't know how long this has been. Oh, not too bad. Um, but I'm going to stop here. I'm getting kind of tired because it's getting late. And um, so I just want to say to you all, thank you for being here with me again. And... I'll be looking forward to seeing you in the next videos. In the meantime, be safe, be happy, and be blessed. And I will see you next time. God bless everybody. Good night.